Hey, this is Wes Fryer for Story Chasers and Carolina Voices. It is March the 9th, 2024. I am here in Brattonsville, which is in York County, just a little bit um, outside of Rock Hill, South Carolina. It's about an hour away, hour and 15 minutes away from where we live in Matthews and Charlotte. Um, this is a very, very historic and special place. Um, this um, is a site of some colonial um, Revolutionary War history for the United States, um, as well as a major plantation in which uh, 139 um, African people uh, enslaved, were enslaved here. Um, and there, there's, there's history here through Reconstruction. Um, and so anyway, we're here exploring this for the first time. So um, I'll, we're gonna, there's, well, well, what we just did, so we're on this side of the road now, we've just crossed over, but on that side of the road um, is the site of um, the uh, what they call the Battle of Williamson's Plantation on July 12th, 1780. And so Huck was, uh, Colonel, Captain Christian Huck was the captain of dragoons from England and uh, along with some uh, militia members of from New York, um, they were defeated. And I think Charleston was conquered in like, or taken over by the British in like 1780. And um, so later that same year, um, this was a victory that, um, you know, was a, was a militia victory, a smaller force of United States militia uh, was able to conquer this mixed force of professional soldiers from England as well as militia that they had brought down from New York. So anyway, um, just really amazing and all kinds of buildings are restored. Reminds us of the Ranching Heritage Center in Lubbock, Texas, where we used to live, where they've moved all kinds of buildings from all over Texas. Um, and similarly here, there's original buildings here, but there are some that have been moved as well. So um, we'll record a little bit more from a couple other spots. So I am inside one of the slave houses. There were eight of these um, brick houses. And as I turn here and you see the door, um, that was the, the planter's house. And so these f four on this side, four on the other side homes were the homes of the enslaved. And this, um, this is what it says um, on the sign here that's inside. A house of untold stories. Every brick in this building is a testament to the enslaved African Americans who once lived on this plantation. The 1860 census lists Harriet Bratton owning 80 slaves and 20 slave houses. Of those houses, this cabin is the lone survivor. Built around 1828, it was one of about four brick quarters clustered around the plantation house. Building with brick was expensive, so most slaves lived in simple wood cabins. These brick cabins may have served to demonstrate the Bratton's wealth and status in the community. Although it is uncertain who lived in this cabin, its proximity to the main house suggests that the inhabitants were slaves who worked in and around the house. Individuals who were skilled in trades such as blacksmithing and woodworking may have also lived in the brick cabins surrounding the homestead. Despite better living conditions, the occupants of these houses had virtually no rights worked at the desire of their owners, and lived in conditions not of their own making. And I'll flip the camera around here and show you some of the pictures that are below. And so this is an 1873 slave inventory. At the time of his death in 1843, Dr. Bratton owned 139 enslaved individuals. That made him one of the largest slave owners in York County. These artifacts are slave cabin artifacts, buttons, a glass bead, a comb, a dish fragment uncovered during the excavation of a collapsed slave cabin. They give us insight into the possessions and daily lives of the enslaved community. And then this is a slave made brick. In addition to working in the fields, Bratton slaves also made bricks for use on the plantation. Found at historic Brattonsville, this brick bears the fingerprints of its enslaved maker. So after the end of the Civil War and the freeing of the enslaved African Americans in the United States, uh, sharecropping took place and sharecropping happened here. There are records indicating, I think, that 16 families were sharecroppers and so they farmed a 
portion of land in exchange for giving usually a half to a third of the crops to the family. Um, and many of those 16 uh, people who are sharecropping here had been formerly enslaved by the Brattons. Uh, sometimes the crops wouldn't yield or you know, generate a good harvest, and so that generated debt. And so this is the store um, that those sharecropping families would have had credits and have been able to purchase food and supplies. All right, so I am standing here on the porch of the brick house, and uh, the historical marker right here beside says that in 1841, Dr. John S. Bratton began construction of a new all-brick two-story house at Brattonsville, completed in 1843. The Greek Revival building housed the Brattonville store and post office. A two-story rear frame section was added about 1855. Napoleon Bratton took over the store by 1870. He constructed a new store in 1885, and the brick house continued as a home for the Brattons until 1915. And so this building, which is number 27 on the map here, um, has been restored and newly opened. Um, so we'll go inside. So this is a display about reconstruction and specifically the lynching of Captain James Williams, who actually led a state militia and was lynched by the Ku Klux Klan in 1871. And I'll flip the camera. I'll flip the camera around and uh, read a little bit what it says here about his story. Captain James Williams, militia and civil rights leader, serving country and cause. The story of Captain James Williams embodies the struggles and sacrifices faced by African Americans during the Civil War and the Reconstruction era in the South. Throughout a life fraught with tragedies and triumphs, Captain James Williams championed the cause of liberty for his fellow man. His heroic efforts cost him his life at the hands of the Ku Klux Klan in March of 1871. At least four freedom seekers fled from slavery on the Bratton Foundation plantation during the 19th century. Little is known of the first three, known only by their first names, Bob, Lewis, and Henry. The fourth, James Williams, successfully escaped and dedicated his life to the fight for African-American rights and civil liberties. His powerful story is emblematic of the pain and hope that African-Americans experienced during Reconstruction. James Williams was born into slavery in 1830 on the plantation of James Lowry in York County. By the eve of the Civil War, Williams was being rented to Harriet Bratton's son, John S. Bratton Jr. Little is known about the type of labor Williams performed on the Bratton plantation, but post-Civil War accounts suggest he could have worked as a cook. Williams escaped from Brattonville and joined the Union Army. During the Civil War, thousands of freedom seekers escaped to Union lines with many enlisting in the armed forces to fight for the freedom of those who remained enslaved. Regiments of black soldiers were later recognized for their honor and valor in battle. Upon escaping slavery, James Williams joined the Union Army. He served for 18 months and returned to York County on May 4th, 1866. It is unclear as to what regiment Williams served in, though many of his acquaintances recall that he returned home with, quote, the blue clothes on. And it says in 1869, militia enrollments of men between the ages of 30 and 45 for York County. William's name is number 166, and it is highlighted there. Joining the cause for freedom. When Williams returned to York County, he found himself again embroiled in the struggles of his fellow African Americans. He became prominent, a prominent civil rights leader and was made captain of the state militia based near Brattonsville. The militias were charged with maintaining peace in their communities and protecting the newly recognized rights of African Americans. In January 1871, Governor Scott disbanded the state militias, an action taken in response to growing violence and political pressure from white citizens and Democratic leaders. Williams refused to disarm, realizing the militias were the only way to protect rights granted to blacks during Reconstruction. The lynching of Captain James Williams. In the early morning of March 7th, 1871, the Ku Klux Klan raided Williams' home near the Bratton Plantation and lynched him. Later that day, the York County coroner arrived at the site of the lynching to conduct an inquest. Members of Williams' militia and other local freedmen had assembled to protect Williams' body. The coroner took Williams' body to the Brattonsville store to perform the inquest, and that's the building we're in right now. 
Fearing reprisal toward his family, John S. Bratton Jr. asked James Avery, reputed leader of the Ku Klux Klan in York County, to send reinforcements. At least 15, at least 15 to 20 men responded and kept watch with the Brattons who had gathered together into one house for the night. In order to avert any further violence, Andy Timms, a lieutenant in Williams Militia Company, turned over the company's weapons and the night passed without further incident. Federal investigation. Violence towards African Americans across the South prompted the United States Congress to pass three pieces of legislation collectively known as the Enforcement Acts. The final act, known as the Civil Rights Act of 1871, or the Ku Klux Klan Act, passed only six weeks after Williams' lynching. President Grant signed the bill into law on April 20th, 1871. President Grant used the power granted in the Civil Rights Act to impose martial law over a nine-county area in the South Carolina upstate, including York County. Grant sent additional federal troops to York County under the command of Lewis Merrill, who conducted investigations into the violence. Merrill's findings became the basis for the South Carolina Ku Klux trials held in federal court in Columbia. According to sworn testimony at the trials, the lynchings of James Williams was led by Harriet Bratton. Harriet Bratton's son, James Rufus Bratton. Eventually, the case reached the United States Supreme Court, becoming the first case born of the Enforcement Acts to do so. Ultimately, the Supreme Court declined to rule on Williams' case, deciding instead to send it back to a lower court. Of the 29 people initially indicted for their alleged involvement in Williams' lynching, only one, Robert Hayes Mitchell, stood trial. Eight others confessed. All nine were found guilty of the much lesser charge of conspiracy to violate Williams' civil rights and sentenced to 18 months imprisonment and a $100 fine. The remaining 20, including the alleged leaders, never prosecuted in conjunction with, were never prosecuted in conjunction with Williams' murder. And then this quotation is from the 1924 Journal of M.S. Carroll, a Ku Klux member indicted for his involvement in the lynching. And he said, we proceeded on foot to the house of James Williams and knocked on the door. When we asked where Jim and his wife, we when we asked where Jim was his wife, said she did not know. We made a thorough search of the house but did not find him. Dr. Bratton told someone to pull up some of the plank flooring, and sure enough, there was Jim crouched down under the floor. We hauled him out and placed a rope around his neck when someone spied a large tree with a limb running out 10 or 12 feet from the ground. We left Captain Williams dangling from that branch. And so this is a cast of a 58 caliber Remington transformed rifle, musket, and bayonet. And that was the kind likely issued to Captain James Williams Militia Company by South Carolina Governor Robert Scott. It was a single shot 58 caliber Springfield rifle musket that was converted into a breech loading weapon. And this photograph, or this, this painting um, is entitled The Muster and it is of Captain James Williams, 1830 to 1871, and his company of South Carolina Militia. It says, uh, this was original artwork by Dan, Dan Nance. And I think Dan did a, a lot of the artwork that we saw around today, um, around the, um, the buildings. It says, this is a depiction of Captain James Williams drilling his African-American militia company in a field near Brattonsville. According to eyewitness reports, the militia mustered every two or three weeks and typically drilled on Saturday evenings. Although there are no known images of James Williams, several testimonials of his physical appearance were included in the 1893 pension application filed by his wife, Rosa. Those descriptions, as well as existing images of an African-American rally of the, of the York Union League were used to create this conjectural rendering of what James Williams and his militia might have looked like in 1870. Wow, so some really powerful history, really well documented here. Um, and I'm not gonna read all of this, but there's a, a good section here about reconstruction and sharecropping, um, but I will go over here to the section that's on uh, the Ku Klux Klan and I'll read this one. The Ku Klux Klan, a legacy of fear, intimidation, and violence. The new amendments to the Constitution led to an increase in political power for African-Americans which angered most Southern whites. Resistance to the new civil liberties granted to African-Americans led to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Originating in Pulaski, Tennessee in 1866, 
The Ku Klux spread rapidly throughout the South, arriving in York County in 1868. This secret organization was supported by whites sympathetic to white supremacy in the South. Wearing masks to hide their identities, Ku Klux members waged an underground campaign of terror and violence directed at anyone, white or black, in Republican leadership and those who defended civil rights for African Americans. South Carolina's Governor Robert Kingston Scott, elected in 1868, publicly condemned the violent actions of the Ku Klux. He pressured Wade Hampton III, former Confederate general and leader of the Democratic State Committee to do the same. In October 1868, Hampton addressed the state's Democrats calling for an end to violence. Though violence was temporarily suppressed, intimidation by the Ku Klux still had a disastrous effect on local African Americans, particularly when it came to voting. Anyone supporting the Republican Party was a potential target of harassment or lynching, and some feared leaving their homes on election day. And so these are some news articles and drawings that were in the Granger Historical Picture Archive. This is a depiction of a Ku Klux Klan raid on an African American house. It was in Harper's Weekly in February of 1872 and is preserved by the Library of Congress. This is a drawing by A.R. Wand in Harper's Weekly in July of 1868, again from the Library of Congress. This article says to the people of South Carolina, fellow citizens, as members of your state executive committee, a body which represents nearly every white citizen of South Carolina, we feel it is our duty to invoke your earnest efforts in the cause of peace and the preservation of order, we beg you to unite with us in reprobating these recent acts of violence resulting in the deaths of Martin Randolph and Nance, by which a few lawless and reckless men have brought discredit on the character of our people through provocation in these cases may have been given. No cause can prosper which calls murder to its assistance or which looks to assassination for success. The idea of assassination, said George McDaffey, is so abhorrently, is so absolutely abhorrent to all the feelings, the Christian feelings of modern times, and of such pernicious tendency that I feel it to be my duty, thus unequivocally to express my utter abhorrence of any proceeding that may have the remotest tendency to suggest it. Such a course is not only obnoxious to the abhorrence of every honorable man from its moral atrocity, but from its political tendency. And the last paragraph here says, violence escalates. In an attempt to embolden African-American voters and restore order, Governor Scott signed a bill into law on March 16, 1869, that made all men, black or white, eligible for paid militia service. Three militia units were raised in York County, one based near Brattonsville. While the new militias were meant to be integrated, most whites refused to participate. White outrage over the exclusively black militias forced the governor to disband them. Despite these efforts, violence in York County continued to grow. Attacks peaked during the state elections in the fall of 1870 and continued into 1871, with a reported 11 murders and 600 beatings in York County alone. One of those murdered in the Brattonville community was civil rights leader James Williams. Okay, I wasn't going to re read anything else, but I need to read this because um, the Brattons, who were the owners of this plantation, um, were indicted for the killing of Captain Williams. And so this is what we read about the Brattons' involvement. The Enforcement Acts and trials in federal court gave authorities some recourse to curb Ku Klux violence in York County. Local Ku Klux were arrested or left the state to avoid criminal prosecution. Both James Rufus Bratton and his older brother John were indicted in the lynching of James Williams and fled York County for their known association with the Ku Klux. James Rufus Bratton fled to Ontario, Canada in May 1872. In June, federal authorities entered Canada, arrested James Rufus Bratton, and sent him back to the United States for trial. His arrest caused widespread controversy in Canada over what some considered an intentional kidnapping. After two days in jail, James Rufus Bratton posted bond and again fled to Ontario to escape prosecution for his alleged involvement in Williams' death. In June 1878, South Carolina Governor Wade Hampton brokered an agreement with President Hayes to have all charges against James Rufus Bratton dropped. 
He returned home to York County in November 1878. John S. Bratton Jr., who fled to Memphis, Tennessee, returned to York County prior to his brother. On June 9, 1878, South Carolina Secretary of State Robert M. Sims conveyed Governor Hampton's sentiments in a letter to John S. Bratton Jr., stating, quote, that all parties, like your brother, considered as Ku Klux, should come home and rest assured on his word that they would not be disturbed, that he had every assurance of good faith in this matter from the president. Planting the seeds of the civil rights of civil rights in America. Though Captain James Williams was never received justice, his actions and the actions of other brave African Americans planted the seeds of resistance that prompted decades of resistance in the 20th century. Their efforts eventually grew into the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. Williams' legacy was best epitomized by South Carolina Attorney General Daniel H. Chamberlain during closing remarks at the South Carolina Ku Klux trials. Chamberlain marveled at Williams' quote, determination to protect the lives and liberties of his fellow citizens, end quote, and boldly declared that, quote, when the names of these conspirators who murdered him shall have rotted from the memory of men, some generation will seek for him marble white enough to bear the name of that brave Negro captain, end quote. Wow, what an amazing, amazing day. I think I'm going to actually um, do a little separate video. We just, they have, in addition to lambs and chickens, they've got these pigs and this mama pig just gave, gave birth to about like eight babies. So, but I'm going to put that in a separate video. Um, this is a, called the Smith House and it was uh, relocated here from another location, I guess, in York County um, and is, uh, is uh, decorated. Woo. There's a branch falling down um, to look at, as it would have in the 1850s. What an amazing place. Wow. Totally, totally encourage you, if you have not been here, to uh, come and visit. Um, this is, I think they do a great job um, not only talking about, you know, I've heard of some areas uh, or some places that talk about plantations where they really do not at all emphasize and talk about. Um, the enslaved African Americans that were there. And so uh, kudos to the historians and the caretakers here at historic Brattonsville. And uh, we're gonna be back, we've joined. So um, cost-wise, it was $8 a person if you just wanted to uh, pay to come for the day, but um, a membership for a couple was 50 bucks. So we just sprung for that and we're looking forward to coming back to some other events. So I'll include links to the website and uh, some places where you can get some more information about historic Brattonsville.